This is uh, lecture number 10 in the series on the ABCs of Communism. And today we're going to be talking about collapse features. First we're going to take the collapse of the Soviet Union and modern revisionism. Then we'll take a look at the collapse of the U.S. hegemony over the capitalist world, which occurred by 2004 because of their adventures in Iraq primarily. And uh, then we'll take a look at the collapse of global capitalism in the end of 2008. So, the one I think we're probably all the most interested in at the moment is uh, how the uh, Soviet Union was brought to the stage of collapse so quickly. And uh, so, uh, this is going to be an entire chapter, chapter 17 in your textbook. But what I'm going to try to do today is to give you the broad outlines of what you can read in detail right there. Now, to understand the two major factors which brought about the collapse of the Soviet government in 1990. I want to take a look at the uh, rise of modern revisionism itself within Russia, which in the years from 1953 until 1983 prepared the way for uh, the great traitor, Michael Gorbachev, to uh, uh, do the job that he'd been selected to do. Now, he represented uh, in and of himself, this new, this class which Stalin had started called the classless intelligentsia and had been able to keep it under control with uh, various police methods up until his death. As soon as Khrushchev took over in 1953, uh, all of that began to go to the wayside and this new, this what had become an incipient class of so-called classless intelligentsia now actually blossomed into a full-fledged class and over the next 30 years it consolidated its position within the official first economy. Now the second factor which led to the collapse in 1990 of the Soviet government was the rise of the Russian Mafia especially around Georgia and the southern part of the uh, uh, Russian Federation around Sevastopol for example and uh, this has a long history to it. The rise of organized crime in this particular part of the Soviet Union, that is in the Caucasus, um, goes way back into Tsarist days. And one of the major reasons was because this was a port where you had all kinds of trade going on with the rest of Europe. And so all kinds of opportunities, the same as there are in New York and New Jersey, for organized crime elements to emerge in that atmosphere. And uh, also because the, uh, the regime in Georgia was um, strongly pro-Bolshevik under the, under, in Stalin's years, but quickly uh, shifted uh, as uh, when Stalin died and Khrushchev took power and the new figures coming out of uh, uh, Georgia were nowhere near like the ones that had been there before, primarily because they'd been uh, selected and partner and whole by the uh, Mafia which ran things in that part of the country. Now, those are the two things that we want to take a look at as we go along. The, the other two other things I want you to be aware of, but remember we talked about the first and second economies uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, in those days, the uh, second economy was allowed to exist because it filled gaps in the five-year plan which the government could not fill. For example, there was a time when they needed to have an emergency supply of bricks so they would buy it out from a private producer. Um, but there wasn't enough money in the, uh, in the Soviet Union at that time to justify a very, li a very large second economy. But it was there. It was always there. Now, in the post-1953 years, this second economy got to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So we're going to want to take a look at that. Keep in mind also that in the, as the Russian first economy developed, the, everybody had quite a bit of disposable income. Now this is a different situation that existed in the 30s where the government was absorbing most of the what would have been disposable income by its ability to set prices at the wholesale and retail level for just about everything but, for example, wheat, which is the component of bread and a major staple in the Russian diet. So 
what we have here now is a massive increase in the amount of money that's available for uh, first economy workers, which is just about everybody in the country in 1953, to spend someplace. And this, of course, creates a new market. One of those places is in housing, as we're going to see. And this is a legal uh, form of uh, engaging in capitalist activity because the, the law there allows the, uh, the individuals who have uh, either built a house or have, um, in, uh, well, if you built your own house, you could, you could keep it, for example. So that opened up a, a bunch of different possibilities where you could get people to build a house for you, and uh, it would be a house that you had built, and then you could do one thing or another with it. At uh, any rate, we're going to take a look at these these broad social trends and see how the story actually unfolded. Now, when this is all said and done, when that is when the uh, when Gorbachev finally delivers the coup de grace to the Soviet economy and to the Communist Party's leadership of the country, uh, the what came immediately about was probably not very noticeable to very many people because. The country had already changed so much in the 30 years that pre preceded this 1983 date. About the, this is about the time that Gorbachev starts making his climb up inside the party, um, party leadership inside the political bureau in Moscow. The uh, so much had changed that uh, m much of what was going to happen now was just formalization. Well, is there anything to be concerned about today with regard to, I mean, should we be commiserating over the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union? It's not a question with an easy answer. From a Bolshevik standpoint, what we had by 1983 in the Soviet Union was not at all what we had uh, been thinking about in the Stalin years, for example or, for that matter, in the first decade of the Khrushchev restoration period. The, uh, in those days, the, the modern revisionists that were around Khrushchev were still trying to act like they were revolutionary, that is, but it was mostly talk up until the time they got an opportunity to demonstrate support for the Cuban Revolution. And when that happened, their credentials suddenly began to look a little bit better. To everybody except the Chinese, who uh, didn't go for this one bit, realized that everything that Khrushchev had been talking about, um, the Hungarian mess that he had created and a similar situation in uh, East Germany and in Czechoslovakia, was um, not an accident, but uh, was part of a, a general policy which was objectively headed toward restoring capitalism in the Soviet Union and the great struggle between the Chinese and Soviet parties under the leadership of um, the Khrushchevites first in, against uh, Mao Zedong and later Brezhnev. Well, what we need to, to understand while all of this is going on is that in another way, international Bolshevism was better off having gotten rid of this labor faker regime in, uh, in Russia because it, um, it had been confusing people for a long time. And because the fact that they were fakers in, in Moscow was uh, forcing them to do things such as support the Cuban Revolution. Something they really didn't want to do was to go get head to head with the United States, but they were being forced to do it. And uh, so, in one sense, this was a positive development because the Cubans could never have survived a U.S. invasion if it hadn't been for the Russians stepping in and saying no. On the other hand, um, the, no one was <laughs> served very well by giving Khrushchev a, a longer license on his revolutionary credentials. My point is that in, when the regime collapsed in 1990, it had positive and negative effects as far as orthodox Bolshevism was concerned. One was getting the revisionist government gone. Uh, and that, uh, I don't think, is ever going to return because it's pretty well disgraced itself. 
uh, there are no countries in the world today that have revisionist governments. So what we have left of the original socialist bloc is China, uh, Vietnam, Cuba, and uh, some would say North Korea. Um, I don't have anything against the North Korean party in particular, but uh, <laughs> there's a great deal to be said for having a uh, non-dynastic succession of the family as the leaders of a socialist revolution. And for that reason, I'm not going to be talking about Korea very much during the course of these lectures. Uh, I think of uh, three possible outcomes to revisionist power were complete collapse and the onset of capitalism as it happened in Russia, or a uh, careful re-examination of the entire situation of Chinese history as was undertaken in 1975 with Mao's death and which led to the adoption of a new economic policy approach to the development of China. By that I mean the new economic policy that existed inside Russia uh, in 1921 to 1928 when capitalism res uh, was restored in agriculture by Lenin because he really didn't have any choice. The Chinese were looking at the fact uh, by 1975 that Madame Mao had been given 10 years of the Cultural Revolution to get production going and that had been a miserable failure. Production was not going and the party hadn't decided what to do about it and what they decided to do was to go to the earlier Leninist solution which was to partially legalize capitalism. And that's the policy they've been following ever since and which has had very good results for China's industrialization. And uh, then you had a kind of degenerated form of what revisionism could end up as, as we're now in the third dynastic generation of the Kim family in North Korea. So I think of that as uh, a stagnation uh, and of what revisionism could lead to. Uh, Cuba is in a special situation because it's so close to the, uh, the uh, heart of the empire that it has to be particularly careful of the constant plots that Washington is, has never stopped trying to overthrow the Fidel Castro regime. I think Fidel's outlived 10 or 11 presidents now, and, uh, but they, they've never given up. They, uh, they keep trying to find one way or another to subvert the Cuban government. The problem for Bolshevism is that it makes it difficult to ex explore, for Cuba to explore, for example, other routes. And yet they have done that. Uh, they've taken a close look at what's been done in China and they have seen that it is possible for the party to retain its dictatorship and at the same time uh, liberalize the economy so that you can have a new class of entrepreneurs who are technically capitalists but are very much under government control. So this is, this is where we've gotten to today. So let's go back and take a look at the fact that, yes, the revisionists, revisionists in Moscow were fakers, but this fakery of theirs required them to do things, which uh, even if they didn't want to do it, they had to stand up to U.S. imperialism now and then. And Cuba was, of course, the first test case. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the East European people's democracies is also the final and definitive collapse of modern revisionism in the international working class movement. Now it's been followed by the reintroduction of capitalism in a new and even more hellish form, one might say, in Russia and some of these other countries. Um, that this is what was predicted by Chinese party chairman Mao Zedong back in the 1960s. And um, it was debated widely in the uh, international communist movement at that time and as a consequence that movement split. Some parties followed the Russian lead, some parties followed the European lead, uh, the Chinese lead and um, there were still other fractions of parties which tried to follow an independent Cuban lead. This was especially true in South America. Now what we want to take a look at is the way in which this revisionist cabal linked up with the Mafia and eventually took over the Soviet Union by 1990. I have found a, a useful way of picturing this in your mind to think of um, the transformation uh, of the Soviet economy in several stages. 
The first is the second economy that existed in the 1920s and 30s was a, essentially a non-antagonistic economy with regard to the first economy because it filled gaps and uh, that was about it that, uh, that existed in the first economy so it was tolerated. And, well, what happened after 1953 was that we have the beginning of what I like to think of as Guanlong capitalism in Russia and uh, we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. I just take, take that name from a, uh, a dinosaur that was discovered in uh, Mongolia not too long ago which uh, is a preliminary form of Tyrannosaurus. Um, at that time it was a small little uh, dog sized or uh, perhaps a big dog sized dinosaur but it eventually became the Tyrannosaur that we've all seen pictured so many times in recent years in a variety of movies and uh, this dinosaur, this Tyrannosaur form of capitalism once established pretty well took the whole <coughs> Soviet Union apart. The coup de grace was being, uh, would be delivered by uh, Michael Gorbachev. At any rate, the, <coughs> the uh, this mild predation form, that is the of the uh, post-Stalin, that is the post-1953 new class of the USSR, the East European People's Democracies, and Mongolia, uh, <coughs> would transform into a monster form which devoured all of the accomplishments of Soviet socialism by about 1975. And then the final coup de grace was delivered to Soviet socialism by Michael Gorbachev using the Communist Party of the Soviet Union <clears throat> to do the job that all the whites, foreign capitalist interventionists, Hitlerites and gringo imperialists had failed to do. And I just gave you the idea of why I use these different kinds of paleontological terms to apply to this particular evolution of the new class inside Russia itself. Now, <clears throat> we've seen that the new class had its origins as this classless intelligentsia Stalin created, which by the late 1930s had about 10 million members. Uh, these are all of the technically trained uh, bureaucrats, what commonly are called technocrats today, who uh, ran various aspects of the science and manufacturing complex that supported the industry and the industry itself. We also looked earlier on how the new class technocrats in the Soviet Union had had two principal components, the bourgeois specialists and the uh, kids that are just coming out of the colleges after, this is after 1924. We commented on how the division among these two groups for the limited number of jobs that were available was very similar to the uh, division that had occurred within the officer class of the Red Army between those who, officers who had been officers under the Tsar, in the Tsarist Army and those new young men that were coming up and getting uh, their experience in uh, uh, combat in the, uh, and, and getting to be better and better officers and wanting these uh, jobs. Well, the Army, Army part had solved itself more or less as the large numbers of soldiers were discharged and uh, the uh, officer corps was rapidly being weeded out of uh, bourgeois officers from the Tsarist Zorus, Army. But the same thing now is happening in the, uh, had been happening in the Soviet Union up until the time of the uh, Great Turn in 1928. Now, between 1928 and the end of 1929, we have a huge number of new jobs being created because of the massive amount of money the government now has from agriculture. It can buy all of this equipment from the United States and other uh, foreign capitalists willing to sell to them for cash on the barrel head up front. And that, uh, that pretty well breaks up the capitalist alliance against the Soviet Union as far as the blockade is concerned. At any rate, in those years, the second economy was uh, actually made into an adjunct to the first economy. So that when first economy regional bosses who had the money to pay for things but couldn't find those things um, needed them, they could go to the uh, brick producers or whatever they may be, uh, and uh, get what they needed right there. So this was happening within the uh, official structure of the Soviet Union. There is a book I want to bring to your attention that uh, was written by two men. Um, 
a puppet named Roger Kieran and Thomas Kenny. It's called Socialism Betrayed Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union. It was published 10 years ago, that is in 2004, by international publishers um, in New York. And uh, if you read this book, you, which would be a very good idea, you could start with chapter 3 and get right to the heart of the entire matter. There were numerous ways that these gentlemen outlined that the second economy is re referred to in scholarly works. Sometimes you'll see it called the black market economy. Some Russian scholars call it the private economy. Others call it the illegal economy. Still others call it a shadow economy. And there are a half dozen others. For our analysis, it's, I think it's best to refer to the second economy for what it was. Uh, a t it was a second economy and it was a capitalist economy. That's uh, what we really need to, to have in mind. It had two components, a legal component and an illegal component. Um, the legal component we've already described about how some of these individual capitalists produced equipment and provided labor for regional bosses of the first economy as needed. The illegal component, of course, had to do with anything that an individual capitalist was doing that was a violation of the laws. Now, <clears throat> some of these things are obvious. The drug business, for example, would be part of the illegal economy or prostitution. Uh, but there were many other things that uh, are part of it. And now there was a confusion within the Soviet working class of uh, the in technical intelligentsia because inherent within this system is that everybody has a first economy job. And if you want to start a home office, for example, a secretary might do that and, and then work in her spare time on some kind of a private deal. Uh, where do you get your uh, office equipment? The only place to get it is from your job. You don't have a Walmart or a Home Depot to drive over to and pick up these things. In other words, inherently you're going to have to steal from your job, like secretaries always do. I mean, uh, there's nothing new about that. But the point is, it's uh, there isn't any other way to go. So there's an inherent confusion between the first economy and the second economy between legal and illegal activity and this wherever you have this kind of confusion between what's prohibited and what is allowed then you have an opportunity for the bribery of the cops the judges and everybody else that's going to be involved in deciding whether your arrest for uh, violating a, sec a first economy law is correct or not you've opened up the road you've made bribery an essential part of the way in which you're going to conduct your economic relationships because as time has grown in those years of 53 to 83 even Brezhnev says none of us really live on our salaries alone. Well what does that mean? What it means is that virtually everybody in the Soviet Union has a salary and since they also have guaranteed cradle to grave social security, medical care, uh, whatever else they may need Whatever, whatever salary they're getting doesn't have to go to pay all of these expensive things that would be expensive over here, for example, and um, they have it free to invest in something else. Some of these people are going to start little businesses, and in the process of starting these little businesses, they're going to have to uh, cross these lines between using stuff that they took from work to, uh, in their business or uh, Eventually, they're able to buy many of these things on the, because the second economy begins to grow rapidly. Now, the truth of the matter is, as these two authors show, the first economy is growing much more rapidly than the second economy in percentage terms. And which on the, is, seems counterintuitive on the surface of it. But when you take a little bit deeper look at this forest, you'll see that these trees are getting bigger. That is, the first economy is growing so rapidly that 10% of the new first economy going to the second economy is much larger than it had in the past when it was a higher percentage of the second economy. These, are things that these authors have been careful to point out and quantify as well as qualify for us. So we have a legal component and an illegal component on top of this first and second economy. Now. There were. It isn't as if there weren't people in the political bureau of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union 
who were aware of the fact that the social ties between the mafiosos and the first economy technicians were getting stronger and stronger. There were people that saw this uh, threat. Um, one of them would eventually uh, become the, uh, uh, the chief of the Communist Party for 15 months. But three months after his uh, election, he got the world's worst uh, disease and died a year later. This is the first of what I consider to be the assassinations that lead up to the appointment of uh, Gorbachev. Khrushchev had been uh, allowed to just walk in and do whatever he wanted to do after Stalin died. What had actually happened was that uh, a showdown had come inside the Communist Party of the Soviet Union's political bureau in the summer of 1957. And at that time, this uh, political bureau, which had, had, had been renamed Presidium at that moment, had voted seven to three with one abstaining vote to kick Khrushchev out and his policies to go with him. And the three of the leading members that put this uh, seven-man group together were Kaganovich, Molotov, and Voroshilov, all of old Stalinists, all people that had participated in the Molotov government that we talked about here recently. Uh, and that took power in 1930 and got the industrialization underway. Well, what had happened in that particular case was that Khrushchev was able to call another central a full central committee meeting, and um, uh, in, in using his contacts in Moscow, where he was party boss, he was able to reverse that decision, and instead of him getting kicked out. Molotov, Kaganovich, and Voroshilov got kicked out. My point is that this struggle, with, that there had been an ongoing struggle virtually from the day that Stalin died between these uh, right-wing groups within the party and the more orthodox uh, Leninist type of uh, people that had been around Stalin. So that is uh, one other factor that you want to keep in mind as we go along here. The major reason that the Soviet Party, however, found itself unable to combat this growing uh, alliance between its own technocracy and the mafiosos in the uh, Georgian area was because the party denied that classes existed in the Soviet Union. They denied that all of this stuff was going on. If you were a kid growing up in a, a school, an elementary school and a high school, your official line would be that uh, there are no classes left in the Soviet Union. We've achieved perfect socialism and it's only a matter of a few days, months or years until we arrive at the stage of communism. Well, it's hard to combat an enemy if you say it doesn't exist. It's an old trick. J. Edgar Hoover started it in the United States when he made a deal with the Meyer Lansky gang that uh, in exchange for what he was getting, that he uh, would uh, say that there's no such thing as the mafia, there's no such thing as organized crime. And Hoover said it again and again in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Now you say, well, what was Hoover getting for that? Well, if you want to be generous, you could say that he was getting a situation where the mafia bosses like uh, Meyer Lansky promised that there wouldn't be any more independent entrepreneurial guys like John uh, uh, Dillinger or Babyface Nelson or any of these, these kind of guys. They, they would stop that, and they did. Uh, if you want to be a little bit less generous, there's a, a very strong reason to believe that uh, uh, those of us that have spent a lifetime in intelligence learned of this many years ago. Uh, that Frank Costello was a homosexual lover of uh, J. Edgar Hoover. We know that these two guys met together in five-star hotel rooms across this country for years on weekends. Now, <laughs> I mean, to me it seems pretty obvious what was going on there. So Hoover was getting two things, a personal reward, <laughs> which to him was valuable, and of course he was getting a reward that he could take to Congress, like, you know, we, we put an end to all those crazy bank robberies and so on and so forth, and we've been able to keep a lid on communism. That was his uh, 
his big bugaboo, and as the post-war period had developed, uh, Hoover had been able to convince more and more people in Congress that uh, it was his way of fighting communism, not McCarthy's, which should have been recognized a long time ago. He thought of McCarthy from Wisconsin as a person who had uh, stolen his thunder. So much so that in 1958, Hoover wrote a book um, called The Masters of Deceit. And this was the story of how he'd been fighting communism as a poet in a very effective way. Uh, a little side story, which is kind of funny, when I got back and got discharged from the Army in, in January 1962, uh, I got discharged at Fort Dix. I went up to uh, stayed in Statler Hilton in New York City overnight. The next morning I had uh, I bought a copy of uh, that book, Masters of Deceit, because in it uh, Hoover had listed the address of the National Office of the Communist Party of the United States of New York, and uh, I got a map and I just walked over there. There it was, for sure. Uh, at any rate, so that shows you that sometimes you can pull information even out of a ridiculous book like that. But the point to all of this was the that uh, what we have in the Soviet Union, the point to all of this is that in the Soviet Union, the party had disarmed itself with this fairy tale that classes no longer existed in the Soviet Union. Classes had never been eliminated in the Soviet Union. What had been eliminated was capitalist class dictatorship, and it had been and working class dictatorship had been substituted for it. But the idea that things had gradually evolved into such a way uh, uh, that between 1953 and 1983 that there were no classes left in the Soviet Union was nonsense. It was factual nonsense and it was extremely dangerous police nonsense because if you thought said that, well, there aren't any mafiosos in the Soviet Union, you would be falling into the same trap as uh, Americans who followed J. Edgar Hoover had been falling into, which was, oh, there's no such thing as organized crime. We've got everything under control. This kind of a story, which of course was not, which was nonsense. But they got themselves into that bag um, with this this whole idea of peaceful coexistence and peaceful transition. And the proof of the matter is, is we have a classless society in Russia. That was one of their proofs. At any rate, the party was disarmed by all of this activity that had been going on. At, with regard to ideology. Now, now let's take a look at uh, how much things had changed from the 1920s through the 1970s uh, in, in terms of the structure of Russian society as it were. We've already gotten rid of this idea that this is a classless society because it never has been, it's not now, and um, it's going to be a long time until it ever is in the future because as long as you have classes, you're going to have to have a straight state apparatus. And until these, until the state apparatus has fought the final battles with the enemy classes, and has no, you won't have gotten rid of them. So you can't even be talking about a classless society. Now, in uh, the primary demographic for Russia, as you have seen, and we've talked about it many times, from the beginning of the revolution was uh, the farming classes. In 1917, they were about 90 percent of the country. In 1926, they were 83 percent of the entire Soviet population. Well, skipping over everything that had happened since then, the total farming population had been reduced to 20 percent of the entire Soviet population. And furthermore, almost all of that 20 percent were devoted first to their collective farms for regular paychecks, and only secondly to these private plots of three quarters of an acre that they had around their, their homes or somewhere nearby that, uh, that they, they farmed for themselves. Now simultaneously the industrial working class and the workers involved in the construction and transportation industries had grown from 5 million people in 1926 to 62 million in 1975. And of the latter, some of these were involved in private market legal selling, service providing and exchange. But this was clearly the type of income which Soviet specialists at the time, including Brezhnev, called supplemental to their regular paychecks. Brezhnev was by this time the head of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. 
So truly illegal private capitalist activity also existed by 1953, but it had been closely watched and regulated and, and even utilized sometimes in order to the way in which they had set up that phony monarchist organization for Central Russia, for example, to suck in the czarist counter-revolutionaries, they would from time to time set up illicit, what it looked like, mafia organized fronts on the ports in uh, Baku and Batum, places like that. That's my point. They were closely policing these uh, illegal operations. Uh, and finally, you had some kinds of illegal activity which was almost justifiable because people not having a, uh, a home market to go to of some kind uh, like we have today where you can go in there and find anything you want to get from pencils and papers to uh, plumbing equipment and whatever else you can want to get at Home Depot. Uh, not having that, they didn't have much choice but to take the supplies they wanted from their, uh, their offices. So there was an inherent uh, contradiction right there. Soviet law allowed certain forms of hiring of labor, such as a household domestic staff, for example, whereas generally speaking, the hiring of one person by another was not allowable in a socialist economy the, uh, because of the taking advantage of the other person's labor in order to make a profit. But there were certain exceptions to that, and the household domestic staff was one of them. In fact, on RT today, you'll see one of their commercials has a girl in a maid's uniform, a woman coming out to uh, take care of a few things and do whatever she's doing around there. Um, I don't know if that's a private home or if that was, if that's a hotel room, but the point is this was always legal activity. You could uh, hire somebody as a, in that way. Now this was helpful, of course, uh, to people that who say a man and a wife are both scientists and they both have jobs and they're in a science city someplace, neither one of them have the time to take care of the house or pick the kids up from school or things like that. So there was a justifiable role for these people to play within a socialist economy. But my point is that these non-farming elements that are now being hired um, in capitalist ways always existed, but now this is going to get to be a, a much larger kind of activity. Um, persons employed in agriculture, for example, were allowed to cultivate up to three quarters of an acre for private gain. Certain other non-farming elements were accorded the same privilege. By 1974, only 17 years after Khrushchev's Central Committee victory, one-third of collective farmer work time was spent on these private plots. That was 10% of the national GDP, gross domestic product, work time. One can see that in the case of agriculture, this system invited corruption inherently in the form of obtaining, that is, stealing seeds, fertilizer equipment, cattle feed, water, and of course, transportation. So, on the one hand, you can't really blame these farmers because where else could they go to get what they need? They don't have a Home Depot or a uh, a John Deere store or whatever to go to and get what they want, um, Walmart or whatever it is. So they, they pretty well have to go to these other places where the things that they need are and then make whatever arrangements they have to make in order to get them. Uh, now contrary to capitalist propaganda over here, personal property was never endangered by the socialist order in the Soviet Union. In other words, in the, the things that you have on you, uh, your clothing, your uh, watch, your, uh, your Kindle, <laughs> your telephone, all of these kinds of things which you have in your house, a personal property, the government never made any attempt ever to uh, take all that stuff away. So personal property was never an element that was endangered in the, social, in the Leninist order of socialism. Now, one of the things that began to come into this personal property area early on was housing. Uh, if you had a house before the revolution and you're not a class enemy, or if you built a house with your own hands after the revolution, then that was your legal personal property. Thus housing became another source of growth for 
potential growth for the capitalist economy because it doesn't take very much imagination to see that you could say, well, boy, I'd sure like to have you build a house for me, but I don't know how I could arrange that. Um, I just don't have the time to do it myself, but, or at least not all of it. Now, if we could make some kind of arrangement where you and your crew could come over here and build this house for me, uh, and it would still be my personal property, then we should do that. So that by 1975, a quarter of the Soviet city um, uh, population lived in private housing. Inevitably, this led to corruption in the form of renting rooms, which was charging rent was illegal, so that shouldn't have been happening. But, uh, you know, that was even commonplace in Cuba when I visited there 10 years ago. Um, the, the government had rewarded apartments and so on to all kinds of people, especially soldiers that had fought in Angola. And I met one of these fellows, and he had a house, and uh, he wanted to rent it. I said, sure, that's fine with me. Because for what he was charging me, he was, he was making many times his monthly salary. And, uh, of course, this is money that he could put in the bank and then have to fall back upon, uh, you know, in his older age or maybe who knows what he was going to use it for. But at any rate, so even though renting property was illegal in Cuba, uh, it was still happening in the government let it happen. Now, this is well before Raul introduced all of these new economic reforms. And that may all have been changed, I don't know, uh, by now. At any rate, uh, so we have this, this situation where this loophole that allows private housing uh, to exist in the Soviet economy has by 1975 got 25 percent of all of the people living in the cities are now living in private homes. Now, that's either homes they own or that they're renting. And, of course, that's a huge market. You're talking about a country with a lot of people, so 25 percent of the city dwellers there are talking, we're talking tens of millions of people. Whenever you have a market like that, you're going to have an entrepreneurial capitalist who's going to come up and make arrangements to build housing tracks. And then your house can be one of those in the housing track. And they work all of this, this sort of thing out so it conform to the laws. And if there's any question about conformity with any part of the law, this can always be resolved by bribery. Because you've already got judges and inspectors, just like you do here in the, in the U.S., uh, who are on the take, and uh, I mean, <laughs> my experience with building inspectors in California is that uh, they're all on the take, and uh, they all expect to be paid in order to give you the kind of rating that you need to have in order to qualify to, to uh, sell your property. So, same thing was happening over there. Now, in mining, in the oil field, as we have taken a look at, we took a look, close look at the oil field before, uh, individual entrepreneurs were always allowed to drill, as long, but they had to sell to the government, of course. There was no place else they could sell, and um, they wouldn't, or if they were trying to sell in the black market, then, of course, that would obviously be an illegal way of, uh, of handling the oil. Uh, again, we're getting into an area where bribery of regulatory officials and policemen is an inherent function of the entire second economy. And um, the law was broad enough so that no matter what your profession was, a doctor, a teacher, a craftsman, a tutor, a dentist, a veterinarian, uh, you could, in addition to your government job, which got you your first economy paychecks, you were allowed to uh, uh, practice uh, selling your services, certain constraints that were easily avoided or evaded. and so you were getting a bigger and bigger portion of the economy de facto in private hands. And this is a further class uh, development of class structure within the nation. But even so, all of this legal capitalist activity did not grow in and of itself into its tyrannosaur form under socialism. As I was saying before, in fact, this legal capitalist activity fell from about 20% of the total economy in 1950 to about 10% in 1979. So, you know, you say, well, it actually looks like they're going in the right direction. But the overall size of the second economy grew because the first economy, by which we measure the percentages that I just noted, are, uh, is growing massively. 
the Soviet first economy with its steady flow of government cash into building dams and infrastructure, uh, factories of every kind, uh, is uh, generating a huge amount of cash. So, as I have pointed out before, 22% of what you had in 1950 was a lot less than 10% of what you're getting in 1979. 79 is a critical year here because uh, it's only a few more years before uh, Gorbachev is going to take command. Okay, uh, what did grow, of course, in terms of the social structure of the country was the illegal cr criminal component of the second capitalist economy. It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, this was especially true down in the Sebastopol region of Russia, then the Caucasus regions of uh, uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, areas that had tr traditionally been criminal hotspots now really got hot. Well, with the death of Stalin and the removal of Beria in 1953, illegal money making presented a much greater problem than legal activity. Illegal activity eventually assumed an astounding array of forms, eventually penetrating all aspects of Soviet life and was limited only by, by the boundaries of human ingenuity. Kieran and Kerry say in their book of Socialism Betrayed that uh, the, the next most common form of criminal economic activity took the form of stealing from the state, that is from the workplace and, and uh, public organizations. So, um, illegal money making, you had the original, the original suite of criminal activities, plus now you had this massive number of people that are starting secondary businesses and in order to get their supplies for whatever business that might be or stealing from the state. In addition to this petty theft that we already mentioned, wholesale theft began to occur. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, petty theft, I think, speaks for itself. When a secretary takes paper, stapler, pencils and pens and stuff like that, that's pretty petty. Um, and if that's all you have to worry about, that wouldn't be very much. But what this wholesale uh, theft was occurring because the docks and the air and land transport cargo warehouses, the ships and planes and trucks have now become a major target, the same way they were a major target all along in places like New Jersey, New York, um, these criminal gangs that we, the, the five families in New York, the Sopranos in uh, New Jersey. These, this is the kind of thing that these guys, uh, you know, they're not up there stealing pens and pencils. They, these are criminal swag organizations where they are rounding up as much of this stuff as they can. They get it for free, so even if they sell it for half of what its uh, list value might be, that's all money they have available for themselves and for uh, bribing cops, judges, and so on. Um, so the point is, this was happening in the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union in the, after 1975 at a massive level. So managers in the Soviet Union had a long history of bad acts, and we've reviewed those uh, in chapter 15 especially. Uh, but these were bad acts that were, had possibly good intentions. For example, when a manager would hoard his supplies, he wasn't doing it so that he could eat the, <laughs> the supplies for himself or his family. He was doing it because he was under a lot of pressure to make a certain quota of whatever it was he was producing. And if you don't have the raw materials from which to make it, how are you going to meet that quota? So if he was hoarding goods and not reporting the fact that he had more of uh, a certain product that he actually needed at the moment or that he was authorized to have, he at least was a good intention kind of criminal illegality. Um, this is what, another thing that makes it hard for the party to police this sort of thing because on the one hand they're saying it's all right to have we're not, we're not going to do anything about your second economy brick factory because you're filling need. If we find you hoarding too much clay, we might shoot you. So it's a, tri it's a tricky uh, a position to be in there. Well, it was not long until large-scale tracked housing construction operations began to occur within the Soviet Union. 
certainly sometime in the 1970s these were going on. And this was the Russian Mafia that had taken charge of these big housing tracks and their construction because they were the guys that had the ability to get the resources that were needed from state or uh, warehouses in order to do this kind of production. Or if, if need be, they could import it directly into the, their ports in Georgia and, and the Caucasus like uh, Baku and Batum, or Sochi for that matter. At any rate, by 1975, tens of thousands of these illegal factories had been built nationwide on the QT. In other words, when they were opening a big factory or a big um, housing tract, they didn't have a bunch of guys out there cutting ribbons, putting it on television. This was, this was being done secretly and quietly. So everybody has, has gotten, that bought one of those houses, for example, or that's buying these clothes and shoes and household appliances, or small items by this time are being produced in factories uh, like sunglasses, handbags, gloves, knickknacks. Everywhere you can look, you have an underground illegal production, and this could not happen in a cottage industry way. It had to take place through the back door of legal above-ground factories. And these factories meant workers were hired and exploited for their labor power, exactly as in the USA. Capital was accumulated through a variety of typical capitalist investment house practices, and as in New York City, every cop on the beat and every judge on the bench was suborned. What happens then, after 1975, is that the bourgeois class structure has definitely emerged in the Soviet Union with the New York five family style super millionaire Russian criminal family clans sitting at the top, some big bourgeois soprano style boss families as middle level management, and your basic hood and one man or one woman is in house hooking, house based criminal enterprises at the bottom. Well, this is not the sort of thing that is conducive to the construction of uh, Bolshevik socialism anywhere down the ro uh, uh, road. But at any rate, the Communist Party, instead of playing a corrective role here, did not always do so. Now, sometimes it did, and we're going to see one of the men who was in charge of cleaning things up will eventually become the first of the post-Brezhnev uh, party leaders but he's only going to live, as I mentioned, 15 months, because three months into his tour, he gets the world's worst case of uh, a lethal disease. He's replaced by another man who um, has the same problem, and he dies in 13 months into his uh, term, and after that we get our friend uh, Gorbachev. But at any rate, at this time, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union played a role similar to that I like to think of as the Catholic Church and its hierarchy in New York Italian boroughs. Where the church goes on is if everything is just fine except for a few people who lost their way. Now, needless to say, a simple Stalinist police operation would have prevented all of this or reversed it once underway, but that's precisely why the anti-Stalinist Khrushchev government had been so essential to the rise of the secondary economy in general and organized crime in particular. All of Khrushchev's talk about Stalin's crimes and violations of socialist legality was nothing more than a cover for this counter-revolutionary process of restoring capitalism. They started out with the elaboration of Trotsky's lives and then took on a life all of their own, as in the fat man's last hour secret speech to the party congress in 1956. Fat man is what I call Khrushchev. Anyway, all of the rewarding of mentally challenged authors and a variety of Russian misanthropic iconoclast malcontents of the, uh, uh, by the Western Cat Press was nothing more than the encouragement of this ongoing criminal activity. In 1985, one of the first things Gorbachev did was to turn over the Soviet press to the worst possible people in the Soviet Union in terms of their ideology and their politics. We'll talk about it later that a little bit more after we get to the assassinations of Antropov and Chernenko uh, and the subsequent rise of Gorbachev. However, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Uh, we're going to continue this part of the story um, and uh, phase two below, but 